This is the Open University. Dearly beloved, another Mama's record is being made. It looked like it was going to be an EP. I came back to Berlin specifically with the idea of recording an extended play. It's just a metaphor, isn't it? Because you don't make records anymore. You make uh, YouTube playlists, which then have a hard copy, which comes out a bit later as a, a, a record. This is the time, and this is the record of the time. Uh, but last year, about the same time, the same season, I uh, was recording a thing called the Synthi EP, which then turned into some tracks on my um, 2022 album, which is called Smudger. And uh, this year I came back thinking I'd just do like four songs or something again. And um, it's, uh, it's eight already, it's, in, it's been two weeks and I just keep accumulating material. And uh, uh, it's got a sudden a twilight autumnal theme to it. So I made some notes. I like to explain my working processes to you because it's interesting. I think it's interesting. This is Venus, by the way, behind. We're under the sign of Venus. It's spinning rather fast. Uh, the planet of love, the goddess of love. And um, love is a theme, of course, on the record. I've got my notes here. Uh, the first track, though, was called Safetyism. And uh, it started with a... a bizarrely enough, with a, a, a sort of tap-dancing tune that John Peel played on the John Peel show on the, 7th, uh, the 12th of August 2004, which was just like a couple of months before he died, one of his last shows. And you can hear these on YouTube. And um, he was recording at that point in his garden shed, and his wife would come by sometimes and do the announcements. So his wife came by, the pig as he called her, came by and... Um, dropped the needle on Sweet Sue, Just You, which is a record for tap dancers released in 1928 by Victor Young and his orchestra. And it's a very jaunty, sprightly little uh, tune at 188 BPM. And I thought, gosh, yeah, ja jaunty and sprightly, that's what I want to do uh, for this record. So I, I started up my garage band recording app uh, on my laptop, the hardest working laptop in showbiz and made a, a track at 188 BPM. Often that's how a track will start. You start deciding a BPM. So that's very, very fast. You know, 120 is the usual kind of, you know, plodding disco track. So 188, pretty fast. Um, but it, it could also be half that. You could represent it as, you know, whatever, half of <laughs> be a, uh, 94 or something, wouldn't it? Um, but, um, I, I so really musically was revisiting the style of Vivid, the Vivid album on this uh, track, because it's got that kind of pulsing minimal accordion, which is really the only accordion I can play, you know, competently. I do this thing of pulsing it, uh, just breathing it very fast, like a rapid, anxious breath. It's it's strapped to your chest as well, so it does feel like lungs, and that's why I used it on Vivid. It had this kind of resonance for the COVID era. Now. Um, I, I, I just like it because I love that minimalist music. It has a dignity to it, it has a kind of uh, urgency to it, especially at 188 BPM. So I, I just played some chords uh, in the same, not as jaunty at all, it was much more panicky really by the time I put these accordion chords in. And um, it kind of sounds to me like ethnic music uh, from Southeast Asia, maybe Laotian folk music, the pipes, the reedy, reedy pipes that they use, just sort of made with reeds and hollowed out uh, uh, vegetation and stuff. So the song kind of really just uh, evolved around these um, pulsing chords, but lyrically it was very much about my UK visit. In early summer this year I went to the UK and spent about a month actually, mostly in Scotland, but uh, also with some time in London. And um, when you don't live in Britain, you've kind of abandoned Britain. You, you've sort of given up on it, but you can't give up on your giving up of it. So I never give up on my giving up of Britain. I, I keep coming back to the reasons I've given up on Britain. 
and they are legion. You know, uh, each time you come back, you get this glimpse because it's not incremental. For people who live there, it's so the changes are incremental. But in, in, if you just come back every couple of years, or or even just once a year, twice a year, you see these uh, quite big jumps, and it seems like they keep shifting the Overton window rightwards. In England, anyway, I'm speaking specifically about England. That's where the culture shock is for me. Um, and um, <clears throat> at the same time, though, there's this kind of, in London especially, a kind of a window dressing of uh, sustainability, um, sensitivity, uh, and safety for everyone. So there's a sort of lowest common denominator of safety uh, where, if anything's dangerous for anyone ever, um, they will try and prevent it, make it illegal, make it, um, you know, inappropriate, or whatever. Um, and, you know, this goes very much against the grain because I believe in, um, um, you know, in Nietzsche's saying that you should live dangerously. I think there's a lot of, a lot of the left could learn a lot from Nietzsche right now because the left has gone along with identity politics and the whole idea of making things safe and the kind of nanny state idea of the left. Whereas, in fact, they should be having a will to power in that Nietzschean sense and putting themselves in power in Britain. Maybe they will with the next Labour government, who knows? Labour, inverted commas. Um, oh, fuck. <laughs> Venus has been destroyed by a connection request from a laptop. Fuck off. See, that's kind of securityism gone mad, isn't it? <laughs> it's funny, Stuart Lee has a new uh, comedy routine out just now. It's called uh, Snowflake. Uh, Snowflake Tornado, I think it's called. And the uh, snowflake part of it, 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 he sort of reprises his theme of uh, when his granny talks about political correctness gone mad. And this time she's talking about going to the chiropodist and having chiropodist's broth, being offered some broth while she's in the waiting room. And then being told she can't drink the broth in the chiropodist's workspace <laughs> studio. Um, and she starts saying this is political correctness gone mad and it's all because of the transgender people. You know, so... He's making fun of uh, people who complain about safety. You can't take your toaster into the bath anymore, you know. But, um, of course, you know, there is a point to living dangerously and, um, and breaking rules and, you know, all the rest of it. Originality, as David Bowie said, you know, you can, in art you can crash the plane and walk away. There are no real risks in the cultural world which we live in. So, uh, at least when you're making records, you should live dangerously. Uh, and also have a will to power. So yeah, my UK visit was very um, influential. And um, there's this kind of emerging view that you kind of eliminate errors before they happen. But there's the line in, in, say, in the safetyism song, um, I want to take my baby steps one slip at a time. You need to make your own mistakes in order to learn. You can't let others learn for you. That's the problem with the idea of a nanny state. Um, Dirk Bogard has also been weirdly important for me and um, uh, on this record. I was watching a lot of documentaries about Dirk Bogard's life. It's sort of ambiguously British because he, 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 racially I think he comes from the, the, the low countries, some um, Belgium and the Netherlands, I think. His, his, he was born in Britain though, but uh, yeah, he... Um, he came to represent a certain kind of Britishness, which I still recognize a lot, which is a rather buttoned up and elegant, um, repressed Britishness, where he, he never actually came out as gay, although when he chose later in his career to leave the UK and to be in art movies directed by um, directors in Europe mostly, he worked a lot with gay themes like Victim, The Servant, um, Death in Venice, you know, uh, Fassbinder's Despair, although he's a heterosexual in that. Uh, Despair is a fantastic film which I was watching recently and I really love Pierre Rabb's uh, music for it. And that was one of my ideas when I thought, what will I do when I record again? I thought, I want to do something a bit like Pierre Rabb in Fassbinder films. Uh, maybe with the atmosphere as well of Fassbinder films. And I also thought maybe like something like George Crumb, what George Crumb did with uh, medieval instruments. I want to do something like that uh, applied to pop music. So, um, you know, kind of high-minded aspirations, which then tumbled into the usual kind of pop uh, tropes that I do. The next, um, the next thing that I wanted to, that I, I ended up doing, I wanted to, to rekindle my teenage kind of enthusiasm for uh, naive music, quite um, 
wholesome and good-hearted and naive music like for instance Talking Heads and I'd found this video of Talking Heads live at the kitchen in 1976 I think March 1976 where they do this song which I'd never heard before and it's called In My Heart they announce it as In My Heart later uh, Feel It In My Heart becomes the um, uh, title and it's done in a kind of Caribbean steel drums and kind of lilting semi-reggae style and ruined and then dropped from 77 in their debut album. But I really like the first version that they, they perform because there are no drums. Uh, Chris Saltz, uh, uh, Sal is it Saltz? Not Saltz, France. Chris France, the drummer and Talking Heads, the founder of Talking Heads with, uh, with his wife um, Tina Weymouth. Uh, is playing the um, he's playing it like a marimba or a xylophone or a glockenspiel or something like that, a muted kind of glockenspiel sound as the main rhythm and I really like that because again it kind of goes back to my Southeast Asian affections and affectations a gamelan kind of almost a gamelan feeling with the rhythms of the uh, metal metallic instrument and um, the song itself is very simple and I've of course visited this kind of style before because on my 2010 album Hypnoprism um, there's a song called The Building Song, which is uh, uh, very much influenced by Talking Heads and was written when I was about 17 and had just discovered them. Me and my brother, Mark, loved the Talking Heads. This is what Mark said, I remember at the time, I brought this record home, 77. Mark said, this is the group I've been waiting for. Because they had this look on the back of the record. They looked so normal. They were just dressed like normal people. They weren't. There was no kind of rock extravagance. It was all quite puritanical, and but also creative and kind of friendly and kindly, there is a kind of wholesomeness, which is something I always respond to um, in music. Um, I guess they took it from Jonathan Richmond at the time, and it was, it was very fresh when, and they took it, even, you know, Jerry um, came from the, the Modern Lovers, Jerry Harrison, the keyboard player. But there's no keyboards, I mean, I uh, made my own arrangement, I did some backing vocals and things, and, but I kept it fairly close to their original, and so I could match it when I made the video to the um, to the, uh, uh, the original live footage of them performing it. And um, that, was, that was very well received. Um, it's typical David Byrne kind of material about decisions, revisions, work, relations, dedication, sincerity. And I kind of just inserted myself into the footage of them performing it, you know, rather hesitantly and nervously. Uh, with that autistic, uh, now we'd call it artistic, back then we just thought of it as tense and nervous and can't relax um, but I put myself in as a little rabbit like a little almost like a interpreter for the deaf or something but a rabbit interpreter for rabbits you know uh, using my usual b612 uh, face altering software so I'm sure people are getting a bit sick of seeing me as corpses and rabbits and kind of chipmunks and things but um, I don't know it's kind of amusing it's a it's an easy way to get an animated version of yourself it's a cheap way to get the gorillas. Um, so uh, that, that was well received and then I, did, <laughs> I thought maybe too well received and so I went straight from being quite populist in that sense to being very um, unpopular. So I did this song called Sichuan uh, which is very Brechtian, alienation effect and um, very much uh, just I thought why don't I make a song where I just build up some chords one note at a time in a kind of rhythm. So I played on the recorder, I have this little recorder here, and uh, various melodicas and reed instruments. So I just built up like four, four part, tracks of a chord and then rearranged the chord sequence on my uh, computer and then kind of made this uh, song which uh, it references two Brecht plays. One is the rise and fall of the city of Mahagoni which is kind of a 1920s satire on an American gold rush city and how it rises very rapidly and falls very rapidly. Of course, a little par parable about capitalism. And the other one is um, The Good Person of Sichuan, which is about how the gods come down. It's like a Chinese parable, Brecht loved Asian parables, um, in which the gods come to the province of Sichuan trying to find one good person, a very Old Testament. Uh, if they can find one good person, they will save the province from destruction. So um, 
I guess again this relates a little bit to my feeling about Britain. Is there one good person left in Britain? Is there one good person in British politics? You know, is there someone who can save it? And currently I'm not seeing very much. Of course, Scottish politics is different. We have the wonderful Nicola Sturgeon, but uh, who actually reads books, you know, and is actually a recognizable human being. But um, the Tories in, in Britain are not, and in England are not. So um, it was very much like the kind of good person of Sichuan feeling I had. Um, going to Britain, but I'm not sure if I like the song very much, I don't know if it'll survive. It's sort of um, an embittered satire on the kind of culture of 1-800 I can sue. <laughs> it's more America really, if you look at the billboards in America, they're almost all now on some streets, it's almost all these sort of uh, upstart lawyers who are kind of saying that they will pursue everybody and everything. I, I'm sitting next to some Americans on the train coming from Paris this time via Frankfurt and um, they had missed their connection and they were they were adamant they were going to sue the train company. I was just thinking, come on, you're not in America now, guys. Um, and then, of course, a nice, you know, a nice ticket inspector came along and explained it all to them very casually and they were fine with it eventually. But uh, they were, for about 10 minutes there, they were like, we're going to sue, we're going to sue. Um, and I used Peter Gabriel in the video for this because Peter Gabriel is, uh, he really took theatrics on, in concerts on stage. Um, much further even than Bowie. Bowie's known as the theatrical guy, but actually Peter Gabriel, he did the most outrageous costumes, you know, dressed up as a flower and uh, Britannia and uh, an old man and this kind of thing, a very energetic, sort of organic old man. And um, so I, I just made a compilation of the best Peter Gabriel uh, costumes, really. But it, it does bring out the, the Brechtian alienation effect very well and it does make you miss a little bit the idea of musical theater but I don't know if the song itself works um, for me it's it's not really very pleasant to listen to so I might drop it um, might be one of the victims I don't know if I put the Talking Heads cover on my own album either the 2023 album from Mum as, as yet unnamed um, the next track was um, was though based on that Talking Heads cover and it's called Pocket Apocalypse and Pocket Apocalypse, um, basically I just, I, it's in the same, it's got the same BPM and the same uh, key chords. And so I kind of rejigged, chopped up and remade the Talking Heads cover uh, into one of my own songs. This is often how I, I do my recording, you know, I, I, in order not to fall into habits of my own. I use other people's material and then I chop it and change it until it's no longer their material, it becomes my material, but it wouldn't have been what I would have done naturally myself. So it's a kind of collaboration with ghosts, a bit like my autobiography down there. Um, so this one, um, it's got very whimsical lyrics. Uh, I, I, I have pages of notes for lyrical ideas and write down things that other people have said, like for instance, if you suspect if you suspect me, suspect the best of me. I think I saw that written on a pavement somewhere, uh, or uh, which ends up in the song lyric. Um, if you go to bed with an itchy arse, you wake up with a stinky finger. Very good advice. Um, so that kind of gets transmuted into something else in the song lyric. It's kind of just a compilation of um, bizarre and transmuted uh, quotations from people. And uh, there's another Brecht reference here, The Business Affairs of Mr. Julius Caesar, was a, a novel he wrote in the late 30s when he was in Denmark. And then it was never really finished. He wanted to do six books, but he only did four of them when it was sort of published after his death. Uh, and um, so it's um, got a video with uh, a jet, showing a jet landing in Itami Airport, a nice sort of little harbinger of the reopening of Japan, which is it's going to reopen in October. So that's kind of exciting, because every, every night in my dreams I'm kind of transported to Japan, or I'm about to go to Japan, and I, I, as soon as I arrive in Japan I excitedly post to Facebook, guys, I'm in Japan, you know. And eventually this will, will, will be possible again, because the tourist visa waiver thing is happening. For real, it's been announced now. Uh, things from the, was it the 12th of October, round about then. But I don't know when we'll go, we'll go quite soon. And we'll also go to South Korea, me and Naomi. Um, so Pocket Apocalypse shows this jet landing, it's got me as a goblin, it's got animations from the UK, 1970s TV shows, Rock Follies and the Old Grey Whistle Test and little bits of 
film texture from a Luke Fowler documentary. Luke Fowler, a very interesting artist whose work is mostly about reappropriated uh, documentary video footage about sort of ignored, neglected underground cult figures um, from the British counterculture of the 70s mostly, so I guess that's one reason I respond to it. A lot of these songs are rooted in the mid-70s, almost exactly 1975. And um, for instance, in DGAF, um, Terry Riley filmed in the mid-70s sometime playing a Just Intonation Yamaha organ. It's been modified to put it into Just Intonation, which is this very uh, ancient scale, true tone scale, uh, which is very distinctive. I used it on um, Shunned, a track of mine called Shunned. It's got a just intonation piano on it. And um, yeah, that was the next track, uh, DJAF. Um, there is somebody else made a track called DJAF inevitably, but it's quite mediocre and not very popular. So I felt I could use it. Um, this started because somebody on my Facebook feed posted a video of a guy called Bob Stewart playing uh, an instrument of his own invention, which he calls the Psaltery, on an album called The Unique Sound of the Psaltery, which was released in the Magic Year 1975 on the Argo label. And he was, uh, Bob Stewart was close to the Incredible String Band. I think he's written several books with um, one of them. And um, he, uh, he, he makes this beautiful medieval sound with the Psaltery, which I, I, I sampled and, and sort of made uh, it seemed to it had a buried pop song in it. This is what I always discover when, when people are doing instrumental music, there are hidden buried pop songs in them. And um, it kind of reminded me of my 1997-ish incursions, excursions into folk music. I, went, I was living in London next to the Barbican Library and in the records section of the Barbican Library, they had a lot of folk records and also in the markets. Uh, secondhand folk records became very important. I thought fake folk, you know, could be something worth exploring. So um, medieval dance music was, was super important. So this became a kind of punk protest song about the um, royal funeral. Not so much the death of the queen, you know, I, I'm fairly indifferent. Uh, she's always been there in my life, you know, the Beatles made a funny tribute to her and got knighted and whatever, but uh, you know, I really um, would prefer the public. <laughs> but so um, I, I sort of, built it up into, it was almost, it's almost like Sham 69, or almost there's a Jimmy Percy element to it, you know, tell us the truth. Um, and so, but, but it's got this modal medieval, it's quite appropriate really, and it comes out especially in the medieval version, the remix I did a bit later where it, it foregrounds Bob's, uh, Bob Stewart's work much more, and uh, it, it, it sounds much more feudal, and of course the royalty is a feudal institution, so, you know, it's all about fealty. Fealty, actually, yeah, fealty. I think I pronounce it fealty in the song, but um, I kind of like that because it's a failed fealty. Uh, fealty is uh, loyalty uh, imposed by your uh, feudal obligations. So um, I did my usual trick of pitch shifting one third up. Uh, often I, I have a chord sequence and I think, well, wouldn't it be exciting if this went up to a new key? Or, or if it went up by three, semitones it would be it's not quite a new key it's quite it's very consonant and you tend to be able to come back to the home chord really easily and stuff so but in this case what I did was I, I combined the two keys and so you get uh, two keys which are a third apart and it, this I uh, technically I don't know how to describe this but um, it's um, a minor seventh with ninth and elevenths uh, I think something about it reminded me of the passage. It's the kind of thing Dick Witts would do in his songwriting, uh, where you just stack these triad chords on top of each other until they became kind of phantasmagorical. It almost sounds like um, a, a science fiction soundtrack from the 60s or something when you do that. Very rich, and um, then you can do some sort of strange scale kind of uh, melodies on top of that. So that's what I ended up doing in the uh, instrumental sections of this song. and. Um, yeah, that's, uh, again, it was a quite populist, quite crowd-pleasing, although it got more dislikes than um, any of the other of the new songs, I guess from disgruntled royalists saying, Allow Her Majesty to rest in peace. Um, Details was the next one, and this started with uh, <laughs> a Japanese porn film. I was watching a Japanese porn film, 
and it's kind of weird. Those are often they're very delicately put together. There must be a lot of frustrated aesthetic directors who are forced to make porn in, in the Japanese market because often you'll hear Satie's uh, Gymnopédie and in this case it was Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata which was playing in the background with lots of sort of sex cries on top of it. <laughs> it, seemed, it was such a beautiful contrast of this animal kind of screeching and then there's very, very calm, measured and melancholy music in the background. And so um, I thought, gosh, isn't that a beautiful piece? It's so, uh, it's so kind of making the most of such small movements, really, uh, harmonically. So um, I made my own fatigued, wabi-sabi, baroque chamber ensemble version of it. I love doing arrangements, and I think I've got quite good at it. I've got quite good at making electronic music sound acoustic and wonky and wabi-sabi, um, if I do say so myself. So then when I'd finished the music, it was just, it was so glisteningly beautiful and, but also kind of, you know, it's like slightly mentally defective people or amateurs playing uh, in a Baroque ensemble, a bit like the Portsmouth Symphonia, which was a project Ian you know, was involved in in the 70s, or even the 60s, late 60s. Um, when amateurs or, or kind of mad people or school orchestras also play uh, badly, and, and it's much more interesting than people playing well to me. I used to be in the school orchestra, the second orchestra. I was the leader of the violins, <laughs> but I couldn't read music, so I just improvised all the time. And I watched other people's bow positions to make it look as if I was following along with the music. I, 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 what was I playing at? And how could I be promoted to the leader of the violins when I couldn't even you know, play the, what was on the sheet music? But um, stranger things have happened, I guess. And this is... Um, in the end, the lyric is kind of sung from the point of view of a mother or a nanny or a lover who's a bit like a nanny. And uh, so it's, it's another take on the safetyism theme in a way because it's the nanny state um, as an aching kind of separation from the, the loved object. So um, God is in the details, they say. Uh, love is in the details. And um, you can't really control the safety of the loved other, especially if you've nagged them or that you've alienated them or they've simply left home and you're no longer in control of their details of their daily lives. Uh, you don't, you just can uh, kind of imagine, you know, when a parent uh, waits up for you and you haven't come home till two in the morning and they're worrying themselves sick and all the rest of it. This is someone who's trying not to worry himself sick because his loved one is distant and no longer under his control. And just trying to, to get used to that, but is swamped with anxiety. Um, he or she, it could be either really, it could be a mother, it could be a, a lover. It's, it's a figure who wants to, who, who cares about the safety and well-being of someone who is not under his or her control anymore. And um, that's a very poignant and sad situation that does occur a lot in life. Um, when you have a separation from your lover, I'm currently separated from my lover, so I'm wondering what she's up to, or she's wondering what I'm up to when, when we're uh, on different sides of, the, of Europe anyway, not the world really. And um, it turned out so well musically that I was considering forming a sort of Pet Shop Boys ensemble with uh, Beethoven, Ludwig. Uh, and um, of course I've done collaborations with the dead Ludwig van Beethoven before because there was um, the symphonies of Beethoven, uh, in the late 90s and there was a song which I can't even, I wouldn't even say the name of but begins with WC um, and there's For Elisa on the Bambi album in 2013 which is sort of played on bicycle spokes or sounds like it's played on bicycle spokes and then the, the you know, things like the Straubs film about um, Johann Sebastian Bach and Anna Magdalena Bach rather um, or Boyce and Kagel's Ludwig film. I like people who revisit uh, Beethoven and Bach in kind of ironic ways or skewed ways and that means it includes musically you know when you come with synthesizers and play Bach on synthesizers for instance not that I've done that ever um, so um, that's a very successful song a lot of people said this is the best song of the lot and, and the best song you've written <laughs> some people thought then the most recent one is called It's Incredible I had a, vi a visit from um, Misaki Kawai and Justin Waldron, who um, have a, a child uh, called Poco, and we, we were sort of sitting around here like 
improvising on these instruments, and that was almost like a jam session. It, no material really emerging from that that I could have used, but uh, it was kind of fun just to sit around and improvise with real people. Usually I play with myself, <laughs> as, as it were. The final track, It's Incredible, um, started with uh, another classical source, Purcell's music for the death of Queen Mary. Talking about not being interested in, in queens and funerals and things, I immediately went off to YouTube and thought, hey, this... This was actually the pretext for some really good music when Purcell did the, this sort of requiem which was played at the funeral of Queen Mary in 1695 and it was played on flat trumpets and there were reconstructions on YouTube uh, for instance Norwich Natural Trumpets do a flat trumpet reconstruction of what that would have sounded like it's a rougher kind of sound slightly more difficult to control and the flat trumpet was lost to to orchestras and to the music world for hundreds of years really, 200 years, and then reinvented in the late 80s. They rediscovered it based on the writings of a guy called James Talbot, uh, who was writing in the 1690s, describing simply what the or orchest orchestral instruments of the time were, what they looked like, how they were made, what sort of shapes they had. And so flat trumpets are kind of a, a reconstruction of an ancient trumpet. So I sampled um, some bits of the, the Purcell Requiem and um, rearranged the chord sequence and made my own song starting with that. But also it has this kind of very heavily electronically distorted vocal, uh, which has a, 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 appeared to me in a dream. I woke up in the morning after a day of working on this track and having ideas that it would have a vocal line a bit like The Bed, which is a, a, a demo um, Gort McDermott and James Raylow wrote for Hair. It did appear in, in Hair, but in, I like the demo version of it, which is much folkier and softer. It's got this... Uh, you can lie in bed, you can lay in bed, you can die in bed. It's got this kind of very um, uh, sprightly rhythm, <laughs> sprightly again, um, which I wanted to sort of make a song uh, based on. But then it was kind of monotonous when it was just that. So I woke up in the morning the second day working on this track with a kind of rap track, you know, the, the bit where um, never walk in Hercules' footsteps. And just kind of nonsense lyrics came along with this rap rhythm. And that's now a kind of counterpoint, a different voice within the track. It's almost a, a bit like, reminds me weirdly of Feel Good Inc. by Gorillas, actually, which is a track I really like. I, Damon Albarn, the most freezingly cold person I've ever met, froze me out with his eyes and actually came to one of my gigs and threw ashtrays at, at the stage. He hated it so much. He was dating Justine Frischman at the time. He was a big Mamas fan back then. And um, But, you know, he's talented. I have to say he's a talented guy and uh, that's a pretty great uh, pop song, Feel Good Inc. And, of course, it's got this kind of, you know, the urban... Uh, guest appearance by a rapper kind of thing, so I do my own rap thing, which sounds more like Neil Tennant uh, mumbling to himself, I suppose. But this is a love song to my girlfriend, uh, really, but it's also a love song about love songs uh, in the style of Scotty Abilities, the word girl, whatever, you know, when you um, analyze, you try to push the form into a kind of absurdity, push it to its breaking point, really, so you push the language limit uh, the limits of language <clears throat> in the song to their um, end. And um, of course the video on this is uh, La Primidie de Mufon and you have two versions of it on two different sides of the screen. You have Nijinsky and you have Nuremev. And um, that's um, the story so far. I don't know uh, how long I'll keep going. It's going to be a very bulky EP. Obviously it's a quarry. I see it really as a mine or a quarry or a storehouse for ideas for my next record, which I think will come out in 2023. It would really be a bit strange to put two records out in 2022. Although the first one came out, it was recorded in January, <coughs> in February, so it's pretty early in the year. And also it is, it has been, my work rate has been in recent years, you know, at least one album a year, because I've done collaborations with people like Joe Howe and David McClymont, and um, often there have been other releases, like some Butler releases and uh, other things. Uh, so there might have, it's averaged more than one album a year, actually. I can't really keep away from it. It is very intense, it's very hard physically not to move for, you know, 24 hours. I do sit on my Muji beanbag uh, in, a, in a very rigid position, lying with my feet up with the laptop there beside me and uh, playing 
things in this really obsessional way. It's a, a, a weirdly detached state. And I do feel this kind of detached tenderness for everybody, people in my past, people in my present, my family, um, humanity in general. I do get into this really weird kind of uh, almost mawkish sentimental state of mind when I'm making music. It's as if I'm communicating. This is the real, my true communication with people is these songs which will be played after I'm dead, you know, pretty much inevitably. Um, they co will continue to communicate my ideas and my ways of feeling and seeing the world after I'm no longer here. So, you know, of course it's super intense. And um, I suppose the closest I get to um, having children. Music is uh, children. Open University. Mm -hmm.